Good day, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on basic forensic concepts. Today I'm going to be discussing collecting the evidence, and then we're going to have a discussion on what to do after the evidence has been collected. I have a fair amount of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and begin this session. We will begin this session by talking about actually collecting the evidence. The first step in basic forensics is the recognition that forensic measures need to take place, as in that a security incident has occurred. Most of us, at least hopefully, will not need to deal with a murder mystery, at least not in the workplace. With that said, it's almost certain that we will have to deal with some type of security or legal issue when supporting an organization's network. The response to security and legal issues needs to be done in a manner such that evidence is recorded and preserved. The first step is recognizing that something has occurred which needs to be documented and that the evidence needs to be collected and preserved. That's the first step in forensics, at least as far as forensics pertains to network administration. Network administrators and technicians are quite often the first responders to a security breach on IT systems. As such, they have some responsibilities. First off, they need to secure the area and limit who has access as much as possible. Also, do not power down computer systems. The restricting of access and not powering down the systems is done to protect possible evidence from being contaminated. Document everyone who has accessed the area after it has been secured. This protects your chain of custody. If necessary to stop an ongoing computer attack, it is permissible to unplug the network cable from the computer, but that's it. Once the area is secure, if necessary, now is the time to escalate the response. Depending upon the situation, you may need to bring in specialists or even the police. No matter what, it's important that the scene get documented thoroughly, including what is on any computer monitors. Taking photographs is a great way to document the scene. If photographs are taken, they should be done with a Polaroid type camera and film, not with digital pictures. It's harder to manipulate a Polaroid and therefore it's more believable than a digital image. It may also be necessary to diagram to draw out the area. Also, interview any witnesses as soon as possible before their memory starts to degrade or before they begin to collaborate on what story to tell. Also, the electronic evidence collection process needs to begin as soon as possible and it needs to be collected by order of volatility. So let's talk about the evidence and data collection process. Electronic evidence is volatile and easily corruptible just because of what it is. It's magnetic data. So the order of collection is important. The first thing that should be collected are the contents of memory or RAM. This is the most volatile of all types of data. Next are swap files. They're not as volatile as random access memory, but are still very temporary in nature. Then all network processes need to be documented, at least all of those that are active on the affected system or systems. After documenting network processes, next up are the system processes, and that is all system processes that are active on the affected system. After that, move on to file system information, including the attributes of the files. You need to do this before you do anything else so that you have completely documented the attributes of the files. Once all of that is done, it's time to make a copy of all of the contents on all of the disk drives of the affected systems. And that would be by raw disk blocks. So let's talk about that a little bit more. After isolating the affected system or systems from the network, you need to create a bit level image of the system or systems. That means an exact duplicate of the disk drives. And actually you need to create two copies, two images. And with those two images, you also need to create a message digest of the image drives to be able to later prove that they have not been tampered with. You can use MD5 or SHA as the hash algorithm 
to make that message digest. One image should be securely stored to be used as evidence. And with that should go the hashed image. That way you can prove in court that it hasn't been tampered with. The other image can be examined and modified in order to determine what exactly happened. Now let's move on to a discussion about what happens after the evidence has been collected. And the first item is the chain of custody. Now this actually starts during the collection period and survives the collection period on into the future. The chain of custody is a document that identifies who collected the evidence, when it was collected, and who has had access to it since it has been collected. A proper chain of custody document can prove that the evidence has been accurately preserved and the chain of custody document can also be considered part of the evidence. A chain of custody document will help to ensure that all the evidence that is collected is admissible in court. A broken chain of custody will negate the collected evidence. And by that, if your chain of custody gets broken, your evidence is no longer considered evidence. So now let's talk about the e-discovery process or the electronic discovery process. In legal situations, the discovery process involves the exchange of evidence between both sides of a litigation or prosecution situation. E-discovery refers to the discovery process as it pertains to electronic data, as in email, database files, or chat records, any data that's kept in electronic format. Once identified in the e-discovery process, a legal hold is placed on the data that has been identified. A legal hold occurs when data has been deemed to be possibly relevant in either a prosecution or litigation situation. If a legal hold occurs, all normal processing of that data needs to cease. That data needs to remain in the state that it was in during the e-discovery process. So a legal hold requires that backup tapes not be recycled and that the normal archival process for that data be suspended until the legal hold is removed. There are some items to consider when electronic data needs to be transported and it's considered evidence. If it's physical evidence, as in a hard drive, a chain of custody document must be created for the transportation process and it needs to include an exact description of the evidence, the means of transport, who received the evidence to transport it, and who had access to the evidence during the transport process. If you're using electronic means of transport, a message digest should also be included to prove that the exact evidence sent is the evidence that is received. Once the forensic process has concluded, or once the investigation has been completed, a forensic report needs to be created based on the findings of the investigation. During the evidence collection and investigation process, the characteristics of the evidence should have been documented. So you know what timestamps were present or any identifying properties that are associated with that evidence. All of this information needs to be recorded and analyzed using scientific methods. Once completed, the forensic report should be able to completely reconstruct and document the evidence. A forensic report may be used in the litigation or prosecution process. In addition, a good forensic report may help in the creation of a better response plan for use in the future. Now that concludes this session on basic forensic concepts. I talked about collecting the evidence and then we concluded about what happens after the evidence has been collected. On behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session and I hope to do another one soon.